Mr Speaker. Dr Reverend David Clark. Mr Speaker, this government, this national government, has destroyed a bipartisan approach to trade that has existed for decades. They have destroyed a convention that saw the leading parties in the parliament work together for the long-term interests of this country. And they have done that through a willfully arrogant approach to the TPP negotiations. This Labour government over here is a government Sorry, this Labour Party over here, not yet government, is a party that supports free trade. We always have. The first Labour government pushed for increased access uh, for trade in Europe. But we wish to protest in the strongest possible terms at the current government's failure to effectively represent the long-term interests of New Zealand in the Trans-Pacific Partnership negotiations. As it stands, we cannot support the ratification of the Trans-Pacific Partnership Agreement. The legislation before us is an attempt to codify in the law an agreement which, through a willfully arrogant approach, has failed to represent New Zealand's long-term interests as well as it could have. As a result, our sovereignty is unnecessarily curtailed for an agreement with dubious benefits. It is consistent with a national government that has lost its way. They are increasingly arrogant and out of touch. They are ignoring the big issues facing everyday New Zealanders, the housing crisis, health cuts, jobs, wages and rising education costs. They are too focused on those at the top, the mega rich, and not looking out for Middle New Zealand. Well, a Labour government will look out for those in Middle New Zealand. We would restore the Kiwi dream, Mr Speaker. The government's chief negotiator could not give any confirmation that they had sought to preserve the right of future governments to legislate for a ban on non-resident foreign speculators in New Zealand's housing market. And then in this House, the minister stood up and said they never asked for one. They did not ask for a ban on non-resident foreign speculators. The minister confirmed it in the House in February. They were so arrogant that they abandoned the previous approach to trade that has served this country for decades. That is the nature of this government. They abandoned that consensus model that has worked for decades. And as a consequence, we have got a worse deal. We have not got the best deal New Zealanders could have got to consider in this parliament. Mr Speaker, other countries, other countries preserve the right of their sovereign governments to legislate in the national interest. Let's not forget, when we look at the annexes in the TPP agreement, that Singapore, Vietnam and Australia, to name three countries, sought wider powers to legislate, which would, could, would, should, if they wanted to include a ban on non-resident foreign speculators in their housing market. Our country didn't get that, but worse, it did not even ask for that right, despite it being the policy of one of the major parties in this parliament for a couple of years. It was introduced by David Shearer. It was confirmed by Andrew Little as a clear policy that we in future wanted to introduce a ban on non-resident foreign speculators in the New Zealand residential housing market because it is distorting our economy. But they are not interested in that. They are interested in protecting the interests of the wealthy few. At least they are consistent. But, Mr Speaker, it is a great shame because the agreement that has been put before this House for consideration, the legislation that is based on it that we're looking at today, uh, is not as good as it could be. It is not in New Zealanders' interests in the way that it might have been had that approach been taken that previous governments have taken, where they included unions, businesses and academics in the shaping of the negotiating documents. Mr Speaker, I have learned that other countries in the TPP process have included those bodies in the development of their negotiating documents in a way that this government did not do. They thought they were above consulting with New Zealand businesses. I've heard from businesses in New Zealand that are not happy with the way this process has been conducted. They thought they were above consulting with unions on the development of this deal. 
because they thought they knew better. They thought they were above consulting with academics on putting this trade deal together in New Zealand's interests because they are arrogant. They are increasingly out of touch with middle New Zealand and they are increasingly saying they are above the interests of specialists in this country too. And of course, all of this leads to a situation where they have not even asked for the things that would help New Zealand's future uh, economy to shift away from the speculative sector and towards the productive sector, which we know will be in our long-term economic interests. It is essentially the mark of a government that seems prepared to manage decline in our economy. And Mr Speaker, they used to speak of aspiration. They don't anymore. It's just now about being a part of the club. Well, Mr Speaker, the Labour Party believes the ability to act in New Zealand residents uh, and citizens' interest is a principle that builds faith in participative democracy. Unnecessary weakening of sovereign state powers achieves the opposite. We are in principle opposed to this deal. So we also want to register our protest at the shameful curtailing of the processes that led up to this point. In the select committee process that I participated in, we had a 6,000 page document negotiated over five years with corporates in the room and we were given a matter of weeks for submitters across New Zealand to work through it, come to their views and share what might be in New Zealand's wider interest because they hadn't been a part of that wider consultation period that previously existed. So these people expected New Zealanders to come to terms and give good advice in that very short period of time. Of course they did their best and then, and then they changed the process again so that the parliamentarians receiving the submissions did not have the time previously allocated to work through them to make sure that we could make the best recommendations back to this parliament. That is the arrogance. That is the increasingly out of touch nature of this government. They know better. They know better than the experts in New Zealand. They know better than the businesses. They know better than the unions. They know better than the academics. They are determined to ram this process through before Christmas because they don't want to be dealing with this in election year. They know that the transparency of sunlight, uh, that, that the wider examination is not going to be popular with the public when they see what this government has traded off uh, in order to get a deal done to be a part of the club, Mr Speaker. We've already seen some warnings too in the material that's come through from Treasury. We haven't seen it all. Uh, the regulatory impact statements that were revealed just a couple of days ago out of MB, uh, very late in the piece. We've scanned through, of course, quickly. We've seen little tidbits of advice from Treasury, of course not publicly released. There is more secrecy uh, than needs to be in this process, and it continues. But the Treasury says, and, and let me quote, uh, that uh, the timeframes for decisions have not allowed for a full assessment of the potential impacts or risks involved in some of the proposals. Further work is needed with stakeholders to ensure the proposals are workable and any unintended consequences are mitigated if ministers wish to reduce the risk of substantive amendments being required as a result of information emerging uh, in the select committee stages. Now, of course, when all of that happens, those, those decisions will be made on the fly too. Mr Speaker, this is not the way to make good legislation in the national interest. It hasn't been the whole way through. It's the sign of a government that is increasingly arrogant and out of touch, interested only in being a part of the club, not in the interests of middle New Zealand and not in the interests of future sovereign governments to regulate in the national interest, Mr Speaker. We saw also in the previous examination processes that the modelling was flawed. Submitters uh, pointed out that one of the calculations involved in the modelling for the national interest analysis was out by a factor of 300, Mr Speaker. I have never seen such a thing in economic modelling in all my time. And yet we are supposed to rely on that as an indication that this is good for New Zealand. On top of this, Mr Speaker, they have not supplied uh, proper thorough analysis on the e employment outcomes, the income distribution outcomes. What analysis is available comes from overseas suggests up to 6,000 job losses as a result of this agreement by 2025 and a drop in the proportion of income that goes to wages as opposed to capital over time. And that should concern all New Zealanders. Tim Gross has said he would pull out of the deal if there was nothing for dairy. Well, there is 90 million uh, by 2030 for dairy in terms of increased output. Traditional modelling would say all of that value would accrue, would accrue to consumers, 
uh, overseas. So we have no value to New Zealand in that. Perhaps nine jobs, nine jobs, that's the output of three large dairy farms, perhaps nine jobs by 2030. If that is what Mr Grosser thinks is the big deal for dairy, uh, then we have really seen how far ambition has fallen under this government. Mr Speaker, we know that the modelling is very rough. We've had it pointed out to us that uh, gains on a very optimistic model uh, as a result of the tariff barrier reductions would amount to 0.05% of GDP by 2030. Normal growth without this agreement in the New Zealand economy on historic averages over that time would be 47%. 47% without the TPP, 0.05%. Sorry to interrupt the member, but his time has expired. Mark Mitchell.